more and more of us are going to struggle to outcompete software, artificial intelligence. We have to start evolving. If people want to stay ahead and gain the skills that they need to be on top of their game and their careers, they're going to need to keep learning. Soft skills, how to deal with human behavior and how to adjust to things that are changing in real time, that's an area that's very, very difficult for computers, but humans have a huge advantage. There's power and confidence. I'm on the other side of the table now. I produce and I direct and I write. I can really feel the difference when someone comes into a room with confidence. I'm such an advocate for everyone to think like an entrepreneur. Think about how you would be doing your job if nobody showed you how to do it. Through the study of analytics, I knew exactly what was going to win, what was going to lose. Anybody can look at their craft, their profession, their, their passion, and become better. It's about finding that edge. More and more of us are going to... Hello. Uh, welcome to this Big Think Live webinar. I am Peter Hopkins, uh, co-founder and president of Big Think. Uh, today's topic is make your future self work. Pareto performance in pandemic times and beyond. Uh, it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome Michael Schrag. Uh, as our guest today, uh, he is a research fellow with MIT Sloan School Initiative on the Digital Economy. Uh, most importantly, he facilitates change uh, beyond the important things he writes, teaches, and, and professes on. Uh, today, we'll be discussing, among many other things, the concept of selvesware, uh, uh, a term that he coined, uh, and the idea of how to embrace new possibilities uh, and new levels of performance in the midst of this, uh, you know, really challenging and, and uncertain time. Uh, so, Michael, first, thank you so much for joining us. Michael, can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Oh, great. Yes, I can hear you. Terrific. Excellent. Uh, so, you stage for this conversation a little bit. Um, you know, many of us now, we've been in our homes for uh, several weeks, over a month. Uh, our lives have changed really dramatically. The things that we're used to, the way, you know, about, about how we go about doing things and getting things done in our lives. Um, and you think that this moment uh, really uh, presents a stark relief and that should be getting us to think about uh, ourselves, our performance, our abilities in new ways. Uh, why is that? Give us a sense of sort of how you think this, this moment is well, put that into relief. You know, I don't want to make as big as the pandemic is. I don't want to make something out to be more than, you know, this profound disruptive time. Um, I've been doing work in this area for a number of years. And what is striking to me, and, and, and by that, I mean, how can technology make people more valuable? Not just more productive, more valuable. So I'm looking at these areas and in, in in this domain in, in the workplace, in the workspace, I work with a variety of different organizations. I work with students, I work with exec ed students. And so snap, we're all in lockdown, literally all over the world. And all of a sudden you are forced, you're not asked, you're forced to rethink what can you do meaningfully within the limitations and constraints of your living room, your bedroom, your mobile, your tablet. Um, for some people, this is, there's a level of technological dependence that has never before existed. Is this a crutch or is this an amplifier? And so what I think is special about this time, particularly for those people who are trying to work with others and create value in collaboration or for customers and, and, and clients, it's how should we become more introspective with and for these technologies? How can we boost our self-awareness and moves the odds of creating new value of having bigger impact and influence because was something that was 
interesting and a source of curiosity has now become mandated. We don't have a choice unless, of course, you leave and do see people face to face. So that's really what I want to push people to think differently about. You've got these tools, you've got these technological ensembles. How do you want to use them to invest in yourself? How do you want to invest yourself in them? And this really dovetails with a lot of the research you've done in recent years um, around the idea of individual performance and that we are not just one thing or another, but we're really the composite of uh, a range of abilities and disabilities, uh, strengths and weaknesses. Um, can you help the audience sort of set the stage in, in, in your sort of cells where and multiple cells perspective on, on, on human performance? I, I am very happy to answer that question and forgive me for just putting it for me, research historical context. The first serious work that I did in this regard was on collaboration. Watson and Crick, Brock and Picasso, Wilbur and Orville Wright, Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. How did great collaborators use tools and technologies to create something that was more than either one of them? And one of the fascinating things I observed, and I was very lucky because I got to talk with Francis Crick and James Watson, is that they became slight when they collaborated with each other. So my book, my first book was really on shared space, but always in the back of my mind moving forward was what aspects of ourselves do we bring to creativity? to collaboration. What are the aspects and attributes of the self that adds value? And when you look at the psychology literature, the cognitive psychology liter literature, the social psychology li literature, exactly, when you look at stuff like from Herb Simon, the Nobel laureate, or Tom Schelling, the Nobel laureate, or Freud, or Jonathan Haidt in social psychology, what you find is that, in fact, the notion of a single, unified, integrated, holistic self is, if I may be permitted to use this technical phrase, bullshit. It's BS. You are not you. You are the, the ensemble of aspects of yourself. Uh, Jonathan Haidt used the um, analogy that your mind is like a committee, a competing committee or a task force. So the idea that I'm pushing is, in, and this is the one counterintuitive, I guess, or contrarian thing is, instead of becoming a more integrated, holistic self, you know, the old joke, the Zen, the Zen hot dog maker, make me one with the universe, we should deconstruct and disaggregate into selves. Instead of self-discipline, selves discipline. What if we thought about value creation and productivity as not how do I be my best self, but how do I effectively manage a portfolio of multiple selves? My influential self, my punctual self, my creative self. How do we do that? How to, and so here's the difference between now and Descartes or now in Wittgenstein, or now in Russell, or now in Herb Simon in the 70s. We can use, and we do use technology to digitally disassemble, digitally deconstruct the self and amplify some aspects of ourselves versus others. I, I have joked in public, and I'll repeat the joke here, that it was really cool to be Kim Kardashian West's data scientist because her Instagram self clearly is a remarkable self. It's been a remarkably successful self. But is that Kim Kardashian West? We'll leave that to better scholars than I to identify, but you get the point. Right, you would almost argue, and that's a very interesting example, that that is uh, perhaps highly commercialized, capitalistic, strategic version of the underlying... Commodification, yes, commodification, commodification of the self, 
Paul Ricoeur, uh, uh, Manuel Castells. Yes, abs absolutely. That is a very uh, uh, POMO, uh, uh, anarcho-syndicalist, Marxist view of the self. But that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm really talking about is intentionality. Who do you want to be? How do you use technology to amplify those aspects of yourself? So optimize me, I hope, is fundamentally different than optimizing around creativity or influence, or you're a good facilitator or a good mentor. How can you use technology to amplify your mentoring capabilities, your coaching capabilities, your facilitative capabilities? How do you become a better cyborg? Right, and, and as we have discussed uh, in our, our pre-webinar conversations, I think one of the big revelations in this is just to move from a binary perception of technology. It is either good or bad. I, I use it, I don't right. use it. To a more nuanced one that says, how can I connect uh, tools to my strengths and weaknesses to augment my strengths and make them outperform and to mitigate my weaknesses and the things that I'm not so good at so they're less of an issue, which I think really feels to me um, like a very powerful response to the kind of uh, natural impulse to shy away from it or to throw it away or to sort of be Luddite uh, about it. Well, I mean, I, there's no lot of aspect, and I saw, and I was amused, you know, that we put up the, the know thyself, that's from the Del, uh, Oracle of Delphi, you know, know thyself, that's really going to be what self-knowledge and introspection means going forward. I want to push back, although, on some of the way you framed it, because the way you framed it is the classical way of framing it, and the more I looked at the classical way of framing it, the more I realized it's, it's not going to work for how human beings actually behave. What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? How can I use tech strengths and minimize my weaknesses? On the surface, that is a completely logical thing to do. But part of my background, in addition to computer science, is economics. And there was a famous economist by the name of Vilfredo Pareto, an Italian. And you know, for, for welfare theory, it's, there's the Pareto optimum. But he's also very famous for the Pareto distribution, the Pareto principle, 80-20 principle. So the essence of the 80-20 principle, the wonderful book by Richard Koch on that called the 80-20 principle, but, and I assume that most people viewing this or listening to this know it, is that for the most part, overwhelmingly, 20% of the inputs account for 80% of the outputs. That in terms of impact, it's a tiny, it's a relatively small portion of, of the contri contribution that has the biggest impact and influence on whatever it is you're seeking to accomplish. So what I ask people elsewhere when they talk about their multiple selves, I don't say, what's your strength? I ask them a different question. What's the 20% of what you do, not a relevant slide at this time, what's the 20% of what you do that generates the 80% of the outcome? When you get in your way, what is the 20% of the stupid things that you do that is really responsible for 80% of the issue that you're creating for yourself? So I am looking at the Pareto self. I think if you really want to think intelligently about investing in the notion of selfsware and, and digital fluency and value creation and productivity, identify the attributes of your Pareto selves. You're persuasive, what's the 20% effort or initiative that is responsible for 80% of your persuasiveness? This forces, this demands, this requires a different level of introspection and a different way of assessing, analyzing your effectiveness. That's the kind of issue that I'm really interested in. I, you know, I'm also interested in what kind of selves do people choose to manage or disaggregate themselves into? So can you give us an example of a you know, particular, what, what is a 
how would you frame, you know, having gone through this sort of Pareto introspection, uh, what, what type of, uh, you know, uh, conclusion might somebody come to and how might they frame it? How, uh, well, I'll, I'll give you, and this is a horrible thing to do, and it makes me even appear even more egocentric than I am, but I'll give you an example from me, and then I'll give you an example from somebody who I've worked with. An example from me is I did several years back an analysis uh, as, as we began logging on networks of, of what, what was the one behavior I did that people most appreciated and led to the most valuable outcomes for me. And I, I took this very seriously. I had very few analytical tools. I, it was more qualitative initially than quantitative. But to cut to the chase, it turns out the most valuable thing I did in my community of people was that I would forward interesting links, articles, reading clips. And this was in the early Facebook days, but I didn't use Facebook or Twitter. This was just with people with whom I worked. And it was customized. You should look at this because. So it was, and I'm looking at this stuff anyway, and it was just very easy for me to forward that. And so that was my 2080. The biggest impact that I had was something that I did by leveraging, socializing something that I did anyway. And then I began figuring out, okay, what one thing can I do to make that more valuable? And getting feedback, asking them if they should forward it to somebody who I wanted to know, get to know, or who I thought they would know and would also appreciate, so to extend my network. Very, very, very simple, but it's trackable. It's data. It's a way of amplifying an aspect of the self. Um, somebody who I do executive coaching with is a CEO. He took this, this notion of Pareto selves. Very, very smart guy, but so smart that he's intimidating. And so the selves were thing is he's a very good listener. He's a very good listener. So the selves were kind of thing that he did. It was a nudge. It was a prompt. We're now behavioral economics choice architecture choice architectures, the whole Richard Thaler, Nobel laureate in economics, Cass Sunstein thing. He always included a question, not an intimidating question, a question designed to elicit information, as opposed to simply saying, you need to look at this. He, he baked into this, how do I leverage my curiosity in a way that creates engagement without intimidation? Actually, that would have been a good slogan for him. So what am I talking about here? I'm talking about minor changes that leverage the 2080 impact. That's what I'm looking at. And what do digital networks do? What do digital marginal cost investments that literally scale to global impact? That's a big deal. That's a big honking deal. That's why selves where I think is important. Sorry for my long winded answer. No, I love it. I love it. I mean, uh, to reiterate, basically, you're, you're, you're suggesting that we should be looking at the system and the impact we're making as opposed to what, you know, the, the distinction I drew earlier between strengths and weaknesses. It's, it's more about looking at the world as where your that combination of things creates the best, most impact and then diving in. Exactly. What aspect of yourself maps to the real world or the virtual world? And what aspect of the world maps to what aspect of yourself? And this is where, just to go back to the argument I began earlier with, I think viewing things as how do I become my best self? How do I amplify and leverage my strengths? That's a trap. That's a trap. I don't mean to sound like the Star Wars character, but it's a trap. I think we need to be more reductionist before we rethink how holistic or integrated we want to be. I think too many, the larger unit of analysis rather than the more leverageable and scalable unit of analysis. My big joke, very few people at MIT laugh at it, is that AI, what technology, the 
the real meaning of AI in a digital world is not artificial intelligence, but augmented introspection. Our ability to understand ourselves, leverage ourselves, deconstruct ourselves, recombine what we've deconstructed in a, in a mortal way, that's incredibly powerful. And that's probably the better design and architecture and engineering path to be on going forward. I have nothing against the integrated holistic self, but boy, I think people cheat themselves when they ignore the potential of their Pareto selves portfolio. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and, you know, I think, as I have said to you in the past about this framework, um, it is the perfect apocalyptic visions of AI and the kind of us versus them right. uh, dichotomy that's so often drawn, you know, uh, drawn about, you know, they're going to take over, it's going to be Terminator. Well, when in fact, the real issue is how do we evolve in tandem? And, you know, if, if we're in a competitive world, which we obviously are, the people who are able to do that with the most self-consciousness, self-awareness, sort of strategic intention are going to end up on top. I completely agree, although I would say self-awareness as opposed to self-awareness. Self-awareness, yes. It's not no, that's, that's, that's a key distinction. Question I have for you, Michael, um, going back to your example that you used of your own, um, you know, determining that you had this great in, uh, organizational impact or, or network impact and sharing, you know, these valuable links and curating content and providing, using it as a basis for um, stimulating new thinking in your peers. Uh, how did you determine that? You know, that obviously, you know, you, you came to realize that this body of people perceived you in this way relative to your other contributions and other forms of collaboration. Um, you know, the, it strikes me that the, to get away from the strength and weakness uh, model, which is very self-determined, and to get right. to your model, you need a mechanism for understanding your value in context, which is something, you know, not easily gleaned from one, where one stands. Well, you, you, you're completely correct. And, and you know, I, I don't want to go into of science. But, you know, for all of the, and, you know, people who, who, who ever watched the show Big Bang realized that one of the running themes was the schism, the rivalry, the tension between the theorists and the experimentalists. One of the most important ways that innovations that drove science was the rise of instruments, the telescope, the microscope, uh, uh, um, the, the linear accelerator, the semiconductor chip. You know, the whole notion here is that what we now have with digital platforms, I mean, look, there's Kodak went bankrupt. My roommate at MIT was on the board of Kodak, you know, uh, uh, popularized photography, uh, Polaroid, again, Cambridge spinoff, you know, Edwin Land, uh, um, instant photography. But now literally everybody takes a photograph. Everybody's phone is what, you know, remember Kodak moment? Everybody has that capability. These instruments, they generate data. Now we can show that, that slide, the, the, the virtuous cycle slide. We now have more data. Why did I focus on that thing about, you know, where I had impact? Well, of course I thought I had impact because I'm a reasonably smart guy and I bring things to people's attention, but I had no instrument to look at that. And then I realized, you know, and I saying, gee, where am I really being effective? I began looking at my email and my responses to the email. And I found that the people with whom I sent these forwards to and got interesting responses, I had the healthiest and best relationships with. That was a, that was an indicator. That's a data point. That's a data point that I designed little experiments around and turned into a hypothesis that these kinds of people were prepared to engage with me in different ways than people who didn't respond. Right, okay. And then also, you know, productivity or value. If, what is myself? What's the data for it? How does it make me more productive? Do I want to be more productive? What kind of 
itself would make that possible. What kind of data do I need? Ooh, I have all this kind of data. What kind of cells should I consider exploring? And what kind of productivity should I look at? What's the single most important thing about this in front of uh, that people are looking at? It's a virtuous cycle. It's a virtuous cycle. How do you create virtuous cycles? How can your Pareto selves create and enable virtuous cycles of value creation? That's it for me. If you're talking about human capital, the future of human capital, that's it. How do we create virtuous cycles? How can Pareto cells be platforms for virtuous cycles of value creation and greater productivity? Yes, we're going to be doing automation. Yes, we're going to leverage machine learning. Maybe the machines will be giving us advice. I, I've written a book on recommender systems. Maybe machines are going to give us advice about which cells would be most, most productive. We're back to the cyborg issue. What kind of cyborg do you want to be? What aspects of your Pareto selves does your cyborgification best amplify? I can't hear you right now. Oh, no, I haven't. I was just sort of beginning to formulate my question. Ah, uh, okay. The, uh, you, you often use, uh, uh, you often reference people with uh, uh, personal trackers as a kind of example. Yes. This is a, this is a cautionary example you use because you say oftentimes uh, people are trying to be rigorous. You know, they wear a personal tracker, they count how many steps they do all day. Right. Um, that would seem to me the logical and perfect instantiation of your ideas here, but. Uh, you think that, that that model can be misapplied. Use that as a sort of counterpoint for it. Of, 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 well, of course, all, it can be misapplied. You know, I'll use a vulgar but legitimate example. You know, apologies to the, the, the gender issues here. You know, I would be loath to shave without a mirror. Many women I know would be loath to apply makeup or do some touch-ups without some sort of reflective surface. The, the, the introspection is sort of built in there. You know, the question is, how do we want to, no, there's an important, if there's a blemish, do we want the mirror to magnify? What are the powers we want to imbue in our reflective media or the media that enable reflection? You know, one is the visual, but we're wanting steps. The issue is not just how are we introspective, it's introspection as a means to an end. What's the end? What's the end? Uh, is it, you know, we can have the, 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 by the way, you have a really nice reflective surface, you really look good, you turn into Narcissus, you know, that's the curse. Or you do 10,000 steps, let's do it 20,000 steps. And so, you're a little physical healthier, but, but your social life sucks. So what is the end? If, if we want to become a more, if we want to amplify our influential self, our persuasive self, to what end? To what end? A better collaboration, a better relationship with the client, and that's the real tension I've observed. I've observed a lot of people focusing on how can I do a better job of data capture than assuming that I capture this data, what do I really want? What, who do I really want to be? So yeah, we're right back to the, to the Stoics. We're right back to ancient Greece. We're right back to ancient China. Who do I want to be? If I can see myself, hear myself, experience myself, model myself in different ways, how does that change purpose? How does that change the why? And in that, uh, it strikes me that there's uh, a lesson for those who are reluctant to embrace these tools, because perhaps, you know, uh, you're saying basically, unless you know why you're doing it, why you're wearing the, the personal, you know, step tracker, why you're engaging in whatever 
uh, technological amplification you might be. Unless you have the reason fully in your mind, then it will become potentially oppressive and send you off uh, you know, uh, you know, in, in the exact wrong direction. I, I, I couldn't agree more, but it, it's like people who love to-do lists because they get pleasure ticking the box. Ironically, some of these people get more pleasure ticking the box than actually accomplishing the task, okay? I, I, I am, this is where I have to be careful. I'm not a therapist. I don't want to be a therapist. Um, sometimes in my coaching and mentoring role, I end up being a therapist. It, it's not a source of comfort or happiness for me. It is not the self aspect of self I like. I'm a, I, I prefer, if you'll forgive me elaborating on this, I prefer to be a good listener and I prefer to be somebody who helps people articulate what they're really trying to say but I don't see my role or my purpose as healing them. I see my role as helping them better articulate or understand what it is, you'll forgive me, they think they're thinking. But your point is the key one. To really take advantage of these technologies and tools, you really have to be more rigorous, more critical, more analytical, about what you want the outcome to be. That's pretty straightforward when you're putting on makeup or shaving. It's not so straightforward when you're collaborating with your colleagues to come up with a new marketing campaign or a new invention or with full respect to Big Think, a disruptive breakthrough global educational and training platform. Okay, the purpose is different for all of these things. And you have to really think this through. The future of Big Think isn't just putting on great content. It's getting and measuring how people use and get value from that content. That's got to be the destiny here. That's why I wrote a book called Who Do You Want Your Customers to Become? Because you're using your innovations to transform the capabilities of your customers. Salesware is how you transform the capability of the self. Um, we're going to move on to audience questions in a moment, Please. but I just want to kind of reflect uh, on what you're saying in, in, in another way. You know, as you've been speaking, um, you know, it, it really strikes me that what you're advocating for is that we apply a certain level of scientific rigor to our own lives. That you know, there is a way of evaluating uh, and measuring and tracking that is more systematic and you know that redounds to you know more probabilistically to better outcomes. Um, and at a moment where we're sort of advocating for this as a society, and we're talking about science and leading with data and all of this, you're sort of saying, wait a minute, you must also do that for yourself. This can't just be uh, an external framework. This is actually an internal framework as well. Yes. And of course, I'm, I'm hardly original. Was it, it was Socrates who said the unexamined life is not worth living, right? You know, so, so this goes back to classical theory, classical times, antiquity. But what's different is the technology. The way we can examine our lives, the way we can simulate our lives, the way we can deconstruct and analyze. Lloyd, aspects of the self that are of most interest to us or that we believe are most potentially valuable for our friends or in my case the way i view it in our workplace in our work context um that's remarkable that's remarkable and i think that that is what has gone undervalued and underappreciated that is why i think the selves where construction and the Pareto self framework is so important because it represents a different point of view, a different sensibility, a different framework for enacting the very points that you raised in your question. Um, we're going to segue now to audience questions. I uh, just want to signpost that for those who are subscribers to our EDGE platform, at the very end of the session, toward the hour, we're gonna be doing an exclusive lesson with Michael 
where we really get concrete about the steps you need to take to put cells where and the idea of the Pareto self into action in your own life. Um, but that'll be coming up in about 15 minutes. Um, but we, so I will, uh, I'm being encouraged to move on so we get uh, some of these in. Uh, the first, uh, ask the question, uh, which cells do you prioritize, therefore? How do you allocate resources between one self and another? Maybe you can add a little uh, color so we can kind of understand. Oh, the, my God. You know, That's... I, 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 I love that question because the person is playing out the implications there. So the, the exercise, just to foreshadow what we'll, we'll do at the end with the, the edge group, you know, Pick, here's what I would suggest. Pick five aspects of yourself that you would like, that you believe are Pareto selves. You know, your 20% of effort or time invested gets 80% of the impact. Okay, create a portfolio, I use the portfolio word deliberately. Create a portfolio of five. Now here's my, my suggestion because you want to balance portfolio. Make sure that one of those selves is the self that gets in your own way. Okay, I'll tell you mine. You will not be surprised by what I'm about to tell you. One of the ways that I get in my own way is that in conversations and in group conversations, I am an active listener and I end up, I'm sorry, interrupting people. I'm not interrupting them to be rude. I'm just, so you mean this? Because I'm, 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 I'm really engaged. But other people, they're a different tempo. They, they want to finish their third sentence, not just their second one. I get it. So my Pareto, I, I literally put on my mobile phone for 90 days, a flashing on the screen in a meeting, STFU, STFU. Okay, I won't translate, you can figure it out, you can Google it later. And it was a nudge, it was a prompt to hold my horses, to restrain myself. Did I still interrupt? Of course I did, but it went down. It went down. People, I could tell, people were less annoyed with me. Yes, that's a qualitative judgment. Why am I saying this? Because when you talk about priorities in your Pareto self portfolio, make sure that you have symmetry between the things you want to amplify and the aspects that you want to rip or ameliorate. How should you allocate resources between them? Like a stock portfolio. How do you want to balance and weight your Pareto selves portfolio. What a productive, I think, I think you'll learn a lot about yourself deciding how you want to invest in your Pareto selves portfolio. Our next question um, is sort of a meta construction. Uh, how do I determine that my current goals are good enough for the person I become in pursuit of those goals, sort of the idea of, 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 of you know, how do we manage the, 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 the change in our goals as oh we God. undertake? Okay, that is, I don't mean to sound like a suck up, um, but that is also a great question and I'll give you a great reference. I have a collaborator, a gentleman who was at, he was at NYU, now is at UCLA, Hal Hirschfeld, H-E-R-S-H-F-E-L-D, and he and I have done work, he's done pioneering work in the future self. And using technology, you know, you can see an image of what you will look like in 20, 25 years. So the, the, the technique that many psychologists use is you write a letter from your future self to your current self. The cheap, inexpensive exercise I encourage for this person is it's, it's you're a decade older than you are now write the letter from your, no, don't speculate, write the bloody thing out about how you're spending your day, what you get the most satisfaction from, et cetera. Create a future self, okay? Now, what do Pareto selves enable? A letter from that or a message from an aspect of yourself your professional self versus your family self. However you want to do it, it's up to you. But the way that you will detect discomfort or uncertainty is how good of a job you do in having your future self communicate and share and inform 
your existing current self. There's a big literature on this. I urge you to check it out. It's interesting. This, I, you know, as you're talking, I keep going back to the sort of scientific method, you know, and how yes. much that informs this. That if you are going to be a good student of yourself, if you're not articulating things, if you're just letting it be a sort of floating concept or nebulous cloud in your head, you'll never have to pinpoint it and then measure from it. Yes. So. The, my dirty little secret, Peter, is that I do a lot of reading on the history of science and scientific history of philosophy of science. Um, I take that stuff very, very seriously. And you may recall, I wrote a book on rapid experimentation, lean experimentation. We might even call it Pareto experimentation. Yes, I method very, very seriously. And, you know, it's not unfair to say that in many contexts, the scientific method, it, it doesn't suck. It can add a lot of value. So I believe that, that in terms of exploring the potential of the Pareto self, the scientific method, artfully applied, can generate a lot of value. And we have a fantastic laboratory. We have phones, we have laptops, we have the internet, Instagram, Facebook, Google, they're all manner, Clockify. We have all manner of little laboratories and instruments to do those experiments and learn from those experiments. So yes, you're exactly right. Uh, this next question um, sort of gets at, at one at a topic I was interested in myself. The audience member asked, are you the best judge of your Pareto self? And how can you incorporate others' observations of you into your own analysis. And you've sort of touched on this, but let's go at it head on. Um, you know, this, yeah. is I, 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 this is horrible. These are like three great, great questions. There's a wonderful, God, Pronin. Emily Pronin at Yale. Did, so you guys know Kahneman, Tversky, cognitive biases, etc. You know, the, the, the Linda fallacy, you know, all the ho cognitive heuristic shortcuts that we take, you know, my colleague at MIT, who's now at Duke, Dan Ariely, you know, predictably irrational. Emily Pronin has done excellent work on, on the introspection illusion. And the point is indeed exactly in, embedded in the questioner's point, which is it's very hard to be a good judge of yourself. Work on recommender systems. You may not be a good judge of yourself, but if you don't click on the Amazon or Netflix recommendation, you know, you're kidding yourself or you're giving them bad data. So the, there's an interesting tension. Getting the feedback of others. That is one of the most important research areas going on in psychology, cognitive psychology, neurophysiology right now. So that's how do you strike a balance between people who you trust critique of you and your own self critique? I think that is a future vector for self that I am, I am looking at that area. So your question is spot on my answer. I'm afraid is that it's a great question and that's the kind of thing that people need to become more self-aware about. Whose advice do I trust? Well, that's a good question and that sort of raises the broader question. You, you clearly are applying this model in your own life. Uh, yes. You have developed mnemonics or milestones that cause you to stop and do kind of purposeful reflection. What are the sorts of, uh, what are the sorts of questions and, and, and what are the sort of intervals that you you use uh, to make sure that this sort of self-reflection is a part of your life but not dominating it and not sort of spiraling into sort of nihilistic, uh, you know, uh, indifference? Well, uh, I'm going to use myself as an example on this, but I, I, I will say that I track how much time I spend just browsing and going to various websites. So I do the pie chart of time spent online. Every should be more regular. I look at my email communications and I and my 
Slack, all my, all my stuff. And I see who am I spending the most and what groups am I spending the most time with? Am I doing business outreach? Am I doing support? How much of it is new? How much of it is initiated by me versus the outsider? So I try to create, to use a good military phrase, more situational awareness. I try to become more situationally aware over time of how I spend my time. I want to be very, very clear about this. Just because I have that knowledge doesn't necessarily mean that I change my behavior. That's a flaw of mine, or maybe it's not a flaw of mine. There's a difference between my choosing not to do something and my choosing not to know something. As a general rule, I choose to know things. I rarely choose ignorance, but I often choose not to act on what I know. And if, any, if there are any therapists in the audience, please do not reach out to me. Uh, another audience question dovetails with this in a way. The question is, where, how do you specifically, you, Michael, um, factor in your goals to this analysis? So I, I guess, you know, to us about as you're, and you just sort of touch on it a little bit, that you're not always uh, going to make changes or decisions in light of right. these observations. Right. Yeah, how do your goals factor in? Where do they sit and how do you how do they interact with these analyses that are ongoing? Well, that that's a very, you know, I don't know how typical or how good of an example I set. I do believe, you know, I'm very old fashioned in this regard. It should be clear throughout this entire I very much believe that actions speak louder than words. That said, you know, to what extent do you see the words, read the words? To what extent do you understand the context that you're in? Um, I will say that that I do, I'm, I'm older now. I am, I'll tell you a, a, a good bad thing about me. I am always looking for, like in lean thinking, what are the ways that I can have big impacts at the margin? I don't have the time to learn another computer language. Can I, do I have the time to learn how that language is used in certain contexts so that I can contribute or collaborate in that context and put people together who otherwise might not be put together when you're connect together? When you're at a place like MIT, you've got an environment where that kind of thing can pay off big time. So I have become more opportunistic. I think that one of my flaws is that there are a couple of big things that I'm interested in, but I get distracted by high impact opportunities that present the chance to work with a lot of really interesting and talented people. So that is one of my strengths. My greatest strength is also my weakness. I don't think that's unique in any way, shape or form, but here's the key. I, am, I make myself more aware of those trade-offs. Self-knowledge matters, excuse me, self's knowledge matters a lot to me. It matters more to me now than it did a decade ago, and I wish I had paid more attention a decade ago. No, I mean, it, it strikes me that uh, this is a real model for getting to the heart of our goals and sort of what is going to enable us to achieve them uh, and not allowing, uh, you know, a, a nebulous cloud of, of confusion to uh, misassociate, you know, or, 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 or lead us astray uh, from, from why we're not where we want to be or, or, you know, uh, so, you know, I think it's incredibly powerful. Um, we have more time for one or two more uh, quick audience questions, and then we're going to segue uh, into our Edge exclusive. Um, somebody asks, uh, Basically, the question asks, what sort of technologies, what sort of opportunities does this framework you're offering uh, suggest? What we're, you know, if somebody wants to, you know, entrepreneurs who are looking to innovate in this environment, in light of this idea that technology can really be addressing us at a uh, disparate, multi-self level, uh, what are the sorts of uh, areas of innovation you're excited about or, or might point people to as, as kind of, uh, on the horizon? Well, that is also a very good question. Entrepreneurially, 
what what I see happening. The, I'll, I'll be very blunt. Um, I I have ended up being an advisor to organizations slash startups that are trying to do, for want of a phrase, the future of advice. Okay, coaching and mentoring at work. What should I be reading to be more effective or successful? Um, one organization is looking at at uh, LinkedIn profiles and how do you using machine learning, etc. I, I, well, not because I want a different kind of job, but I want to have different kinds of projects. I want to be invited to different kinds of projects. So what can I do on LinkedIn and I'll pick a name at random, GitHub, that will get me invited on these kinds of projects versus those kinds of projects. So anything that appeals to people's personal or professional development, the odds are pretty good you're going to be able to build a decent business case. The challenge is getting the data, the algorithms, et cetera. But it really boils down to, you know, again, I wrote a book with this title, Who Do You Want Your Customers to Become? This is the Pareto cell portfolio of Pareto cell framework is in the business of transformation. How do we transform our customers, our clients? How do we use our innovations to invest in the competencies, the capabilities, the creativity, the human capital of our customers and clients? So instead of asking yourself, what problem am I solving? How, in the course of addressing this issue, will we be transforming our best customers and our typical customers? I think that's the framework I would bring to applying this in a market. Well, Michael, uh, thank you for that. We have hit our time for our uh, public broadcast. Great questions, great questions. I'm so grateful, terrific. Yeah, and thank you uh, to all of our public viewers on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Big Think. Uh, greatly appreciate your participation and for joining us. Uh, also, thank you. Programming note: um, Our next Big Think Live webinar will be uh, May fifteenth uh, with education and innovative uh, innovator and author Ryan Craig, who's really at the forefront of looking at new models of education uh, and how we can use the in this moment to rethink the way uh, we deliver the education scale. Uh, so please join us uh, uh, there at, on May 15th. And Michael, thank you again. Hold on. We will be uh, segueing uh, to our Edge exclusive lesson uh, after a uh, couple of moments. Thank you again, thank everybody. You. Thank you so much. <laughs>